Welcome to today's episode of Speak On Stage. We're live on LinkedIn and really excited to have you with us. Today, we're going to be asking what happens to those who ignore the AI tsunami. Uh, I just read an article this morning that said that literally 50% of all jobs worldwide will be gone in 2027. Uh, but that's going to give us all prosperity. What does that mean if you've got no job? Those are the questions going to be asking. Uh, welcome to the session. And uh, it's recorded live to share with you and share with everybody else, just in case they missed it. This is Speak On Stage. And we're live. And it looks like it might be on my own because I made a mistake of saying that we're going to be going at a much later time. <laughs> That'll serve me right. Um, I did actually say on the event that we're going to be going live at five till six o'clock uh, Dubai time. And uh, clearly I got it wrong because I had a really busy week. Dave, how busy was your week? Very busy, but it doesn't matter. We're here now. If you're very welcome to join us. Um, for today's broadcast, I'd love to be able to have you as part of our conversation because uh, things are heating up in the AI world. Nice to see you, Naif, by the way. And there's lots to discuss, lots of challenges, lots of things that are going to be good, bad, and ugly. The question is always about what are you going to do about them? So I was reading an article earlier, which is something that blew me away. And this article was saying that a top VC is called Kefu Lee, says in his prediction that AI will displace 50% of all jobs by 2027. Um, and he reckons that's uh, accurate. Now, Elon Musk has recently said that all jobs will disappear as a direct result of AI. What does that mean for us? Well, that's a terrible thing. Uh, and uh, I'll explain more about that a little bit later on. I don't think I need to explain too much about how terrible it is if there are no jobs for anybody. Uh, how are you going to pay rent? How are you going to pay for school fees? How are you going to pay for, like, I don't know, dinner and things like that? Joanne, nice to see you. Um, we're a bit quiet today. I have to see uh, Zara as well. Um, Aziz, I'm not sure if she's going to join us. And also, it's my mistake. I uh, put the wrong timing on the invites for the event. And I, did, I thought, well, this is a bit strange. I normally have a warning saying, Dave, you're going live in like an hour or half an hour or something. Uh, and I realized I'd put completely the wrong time because it's been that kind of week, which is a little bit crazy, but not to worry. For those who turn up, we'll do something. For those who don't turn up, they won't care because they're not bothered anyway. It's a Sunday. Um, kind of strange day today. Uh, not because every Sunday is strange, but this one's kind of weird more than anything. My cousin's getting married in the UK and uh, I want to wish him the very best of luck with that. And Josh and uh, Alex will be very, very happy together. Um, but everybody in my family is going because I don't live in the UK, I live in Dubai. And so it's kind of like you, you want to say, can you just wait till I get back? So it's more convenient so I can be there and enjoy cake and, and, and the festivities and the celebrations and get myself on the wedding photos. But you can't really do that when they arrange it. It is what it is. So uh, I know that I'll get some videos of, of everybody enjoying themselves and so on. But you know what it's like about wedding photos. If you're not on wedding photos, when we look back at it years and years later, you didn't exist as a human being. And if you're lucky, we'll say, oh, it's a shame Dave wasn't there. But more likely, we just won't bring you up in a conversation. We'll just say, oh, remember this that happened and that that happened. And that is it. So I'm kind of grieving a little bit for not being at the wedding. But at the same time, it is what it is. So I wish him the very best of luck with that. If you'd like to join us on stage, a conversation today is probably going to be me and the. I don't know if Debbie's going to be joining us. I don't think Aziz is going to be joining us today. Uh, but I like to keep the continuity. There's a couple of things to discuss. First of all, uh, I've mentioned this before, and it's not a subject that's gone anywhere fast. What happens to those who ignore the AI tsunami? I have talked about this at length, about the fact that some people are going, no, 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 no. Uh, and I, I think that those who are worried about their jobs should be even more worried about their jobs. But I think that everybody should be looking for a way to reinvent and add extra bits to what they do, because there's so much coming your way. Elon Musk, as I mentioned earlier, has said that he fully expects all jobs to disappear. Now, here's the thing that scares me. When you've got somebody with the position of Elon Musk to turn around and say, we're going to have a world of prosperity where you don't have to pay for anything and all the rest of it, I'm thinking, well, hold on. Do you remember 
when we used to go and buy something and you'd buy it and you'd own it, not have to wait a year for the subscription to come up again. And then you'd have to pay for it again. That's the world we're in right now. You don't really own anything that's digital. All you get is access to it for a period of time. And that's a business model that everybody's kind of sticking with. So you've got some people who make a lot of money out of it. And some people are constantly forking out a lot of money every month or every year to get access to stuff. So how does this work out? If we have AI picking up all the difficult jobs and doing all the blue collar and white collar jobs, in case you don't know the difference between them, blue collar means that you're doing stuff with your hands and doing stuff that's active and white collar tends to mean that you're using your intellect and pressing on a keyboard. That's kind of how it all fits in together. But I apologize if anybody's white collar or does blue collar and vice versa. But that's basically, I think, the definition. But if you are going to have jobs disappearing from both sides equally, then how do you fill that gap? And also, you need to then have a whole world that turns around and says, you know what? Money is not important. Please feel free to have burger and have like, um, you know, um, delicious food from my shop as much as you want, because it doesn't matter how you pay for it. That's the bit that worries me. Not that we don't create incredible ways of doing jobs faster, but how does the economy work for your average person who spent their entire lifetime getting ready for that? And if that is the case, as Elon Musk says, Elon Musk has this wonderful ability to not have to pay for anything really, because he's kind of like the richest man in the world. For anybody who's not the richest person in the world, you're very aware of how much money comes in, how much money goes out, and the decisions you have to make about what that's going to mean for you. Well, that leaves us with a massive gap, which is, what are we going to do when uh, they decide to replace us with a new system or a new job and all the rest of it? First thing I'd recommend is discussion. Next thing I'd recommend is screaming. Thing I'd recommend after that is getting up to speed with AI. One of the things you really have to consider with all of this is how you can create that life raft for yourself that guarantees you can have income, or at least it guarantees that you're slightly ahead of the game when it comes to everybody else wondering, where do I fit in? It's a massive challenge, a real difficult situation for everybody to deal with. And I'd love to know your thoughts and your opinions on this. I'm open to everything on this. So if you'd like to join us, all you got to do is stick your hand up and join us on stage. One thing I will say, there's a couple of caveats whenever we do get guests on speak uh, on stage to speak. Is first of all, try and keep your intro to a limited amount. Obviously, say hi to everybody, but then get straight into it because we want to. We've only got an hour of a show, and we want to make sure we get as many things brainstormed, as many people's solutions uh, given as possible. But also, don't make it a monologue. You know, I do this, I do that, and I've done this for many years. It's not like a job interview. We don't care. We just want to see how we can help you with this particular conversation is what it's all about. Um, and also, it's just make sure that your internet is good. If it's like scratchy or you've kind of got a cable that needs fixing on your headset, then we may ask you to leave a stage. Not in a horrible way, in a nice way. I just press a button and the trap door disappears. It's like a digital thing. Hello to Jorge as well. Good to see you as well. So we've got a good group of people. All you've got to do is put your hand up to join me on stage, and you're very welcome to do so. The question today is all about the AI tsunami. And it's really strange when I look at the... I don't know if you saw the picture I created for today's live event, but it's got a load of older people with great Gray hair of which I am one, not in that particular picture, but a gray hair person. Um, and they're all kind of using laptops underneath the ground because that's kind of where you'd be living if you're homeless but trying to keep with a job. And uh, I sort of did it tongue in cheek, but only semi tongue in cheek. The tongue in cheek bit is the fact that you probably wouldn't be able to get access to Wi Fi, so what are you doing on your laptops? But the reality is. Um, the world has to turn around and suddenly accept, you know what, let's look after everybody. I don't see that coming. I saw what happened during a pandemic when suddenly less people cared. After about two months of, are you okay? Everyone just went back to work and said, well, I'm okay, so I'm not bothered about anybody else. And for those of us who were in a job where it really needed to have work coming back and people back in the office and people going to events, then it was really difficult for two years. Nobody cared about speakers or events or live entertainment. And it's a very challenging time for anybody in that kind of industry. I see that, but I see that everywhere. I'd love to know your thoughts and your opinions. There's only us in this little room today, so please feel free. Stick your hand up 
Come and join me on stage and share your ideas and opinions. And even better, if you have a solution on how we're all going to survive, then that'd be useful to share as well. There's a couple of things I've always recommended. First of all, um, I'll go through the list while people are deciding whether to join us on stage. And you're very welcome, by the way, if you don't know how to do it, all you have to do is press a button somewhere on your keyboard where it's got um, the, the LinkedIn Live session. And it just says, go on stage or ask to join on stage and then i'll just click a link click a button and then you just need to enable your microphone and say hi dave and hello everybody and how are you today and all the usual stuff that we care about and then get straight into your answers i'd love your thoughts on this because i don't think there's a single person on the planet that it doesn't affect so uh, rather than me doing a one hour monologue which i'm more than happy to do but it kind of would be a little bit boring for you let's make it as interactive as possible so to go through the list as i mentioned here first of all embrace continuous learning now i've got all these details by the way inside the details of this today's session uh, and it hasn't changed since last week's session because i think they're just equally important uh, I would say that to add to the list is the one bit I'd say is number 11, which is run after Elon Musk and with a notepad and write stuff every, every, everywhere he says something, write it down because that's where things are going to go. So number one, embrace continuous learning. Number two, boost your AI smarts. Get up to date with AI. Uh, number three, Build a stellar personal brand, one where people can see who you are and find a value. They shouldn't have to look for you. They should find you straight away. And also, as I've mentioned before, don't try and rely on Google. Google's changing. People won't be Googling things in the same way as they've done for the last 10 odd years or whatever. Instead, what they're going to be doing is just looking to see whose profile comes up on perplexity and so on. So it's going to be a very different game. Google have changed their business model to fit in with this as well. So if you're just kind of just taking it easy and saying, no, we'll be fine. We've always been fine. This is the biggest disruption we've had in our lifetime and possibly in most lifetimes because things are going to alter so dramatically. Um, number four, polish for human skills, leaning into what you do really well, human creativity, empathy, personal touch, understanding what people do really well and how you can interact and supply them. Number five, network like a pro, as in professional, not what else pro might stand for. I can say this now because my wife's not listening. Um, connect with folks within and beyond your industry. You never know where your big opportunity could come from next. Number six, find a mentor, somebody like me or somebody who you know can help you get there faster because they can see the changes that you've got to go through. I've got to admit, and I've said this several times when it came to the pandemic, the biggest worry I had is how am I going to feed the, the wife and the daughter and the dogs and pay for the, the car loan and everything else? And we had to pivot, but we got through it. There's lots of things now that are not so easy to pivot for most people, but I know that I'll be all right because I've already been through this before. And I think that for everybody who's saying, you know what, Dave, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. Let's just wait. Forget waiting. Waiting is now. This is the time to get into action. No, so number seven, be open to new roles. Uh, I would add to that when it looks at your job description, AI could replace you, but maybe there's a part of it that you do really well that AI won't be able to cover. Bearing in mind, everything you're thinking about and all your expertise could be covered, but maybe not the way you could. So look at new roles and adapt and even steer that change so you can position yourself as the best of whatever that particular thing is. Uh, number eight, Leverage AI tools, get lots of tools all the time. I mean, start with ChatGPT, but there are so many different types of it popping up on the radar. Have a look at those too. Um, number nine, drive innovation. Be part of the solution. Get out there in the workplace, connect with people, let them know that you're thinking bigger than everybody else. And number 10, master change management. Equip yourself and your team to start looking at the industry and using AI enhanced realities. Don't just go, oh, we might be okay. Don't do that. Get straight into it and start making a change now. Sorry to interrupt your podcast, just a quick one. If you've watched what I've done for the last couple of years and thought to yourself, I wonder what Dave could do for me, now's your chance to find out. Whether it's growing your personal brand, speaking on stages around the world and getting paid while traveling for free, or maybe you want a podcast or maybe you want to write a book or creating followers and fans or having retreats or an online course or maybe starting your side hustle. Whatever it is, we can create something that's perfect for you, your own signature product. 
So what do you do? Well, very simply, all you need to do is register at this QR code or go to www.speakonstage.com backslash summer VIP backslash and then register. Once confirmed, you get set details of how we can book to work together. Two sessions with a load of incredible content to raise your game. You will also be able to be incredible on LinkedIn, get over imposter syndrome, create messaging that your clients will love and buy into. You'll be able to create your personal brand and also become a guest on other people's podcasts and more. What more could you possibly want? Just me and you working together, having a ton of fun and getting you to where you need to be. The world is changing more rapidly than ever before and I want you to be positioned as the best that you can be. So all you have to do is go to this, register, and then let's help you jump and grow wings on the way down. That's it, back to the podcast. Does it sound like I'm being dramatic? Well, when I call it an AI tsunami, imagine, and I, I don't mean disrespect to anybody who might have gone through the experience of a tsunami, but imagine you are told, what's that huge wall of water? Why has the sea gone out? And you realize it's only a matter of time till this thing comes in. The figures we talked about this morning, top VC, Kei Fu Lee, who's uh, running an AI company, saying that by 2027, 50% of all jobs will have gone be replaced maybe but that asks the question with your job will yours be replaced or will you be okay now if you say dave i'm a gardener okay well have you not seen what's been happening at tesla with creating robots that can do all the domestic chores i'm sure at some point doing your garden will be part of it i mean i don't know if anybody in this group has got access to those little um r2d2 style um vacuum cleaners that look a bit like a dustbin lid, but they whiz around your house and just clean up rubbish. And they bump into things and they can tell where they are and so on. Well, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that stuff happening at the very, very least. So is that exciting? Yes, it is. But unless you are financially independent, and even that isn't a guarantee, because anything can happen to stock exchange and so on, I really do worry about what that is going to mean for us. So if you have a thought on it, or an opinion, I've just done 15 minutes of chatting. I can continue for another 45 that we had a, have a dead stop at two o'clock Dubai time. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions or anything that you're doing to change the game for you. Feel free to ask any questions and I'll be more than happy to share my opinion and I'm sure lots of people in the room will do so as well. If you wanna leave stuff in the comments, normally I'd say do that. The problem is I can't read them at the same time as actually manning the, um, or personing, I think that's probably a phrase to use, um, this particular podcast. So um, you're gonna have to talk in real time and talk to me about that. So Dave, why is it that you're on your own today? Well, because I put the timing wrong, and the good thing is you guys are just looking to jump in, which is fantastic, very happy with that. But I've been putting together my keynote presentation for speaking in the Vatican. And when I say the Vatican, I don't mean like a pub or a cafe called Vatican somewhere in downtown. I'm talking about the actual one in Rome. And uh, Pope Francis may well appear as well, I've been told. I'm looking forward to that. But it's going to be a ring full of Nobel Prize winners and heads of state. And so what do you do when you've got a keynote? We get 10 minutes each, there's about 20, 30 of us, we all get 10 minutes. And it's not a standing keynote, it's going to be one where you're sitting down, like in the, the United Nations, I was going to say League of Nations. <laughs> the United Nations, where you're sitting there with a name badge, uh, and it's your turn to speak. So from a sitting position, you can, uh, you've can got a clicker so you can change the stuff that comes up on the screens. But really, you're talking from a sitting position, which is very challenging for me because I like to be animated, I like to walk around the room. But it's like that question that comes up, you know, at Christmas or Eid. What do you buy somebody who's got everything already? What could I possibly share with a room full of decision makers, inventors, scientists, heads of state who can get access to everything? What can little old me come up with that would be something that makes them go, ah, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. So I came up with an idea. I'll share a little bit with it with you while I'm waiting for somebody to volunteer. Joanne, I'm looking at you first. Uh, and uh, Jorge as well as well, uh, as, did I say as well twice, um, and Simonetta, what would you put? So I came up with a concept, um, which is uh, the art of hypnotic speaking. So how do you mix hypnosis and speaking to be able to dominate an audience? 
Let me share a little bit of that with you. I'm not going to show you the visuals because I spent too long working on them to show them to everybody. But I will share a little bit with you. The idea is with this that um, I share with the, the concept that as you start creating this relationship with your audience, you need to be positioned so people understand who you are and what it is that you bring to them. When you do this effectively, then a couple of things happen. First of all, you end up in a situation where the people that you're speaking to want to follow and find out more about you, but also you have huge influence, but you've got to earn it. You've got to make sure that when you do it properly, people will want to follow you. So I've taken a template because remember, I'm going to be um, in the Vatican, which is the home of the Pope and the, the, the head of a Catholic church and so on. Um, and I'm not going to talk about my religious um, beliefs or lack of beliefs. I'm not going to talk about yours either. Just imagine the concept of being there in front of all these decision makers. I have to respect the place where we are, but I also have to share with the fact that I'm imagining that everybody who's in the room has got challenges reaching their audience. So how do we do that more effectively? That's what my presentation is about. I've got 10 minutes to talk about how to inspire, how to lead, how to tap into people's faith. And that's not necessarily about religion. It's your faith in you when you position yourself as a thought leader and use that to create trust and credibility. I've also got an incredible, I've been working on this all week, uh, a mind model of what happens with hypnosis so you can resonate with your audience. But also, there's something that you probably haven't realized, but you may do if you're working in the coaching or in hypnosis space, or you've done NLP. People are always in a trance state. They always go into trance of some description. And they do that about 20 different times during the day, depending on which one they're focusing on. So that includes daydreaming, reading, watching TV or movies, listening to music, driving, engaging in hobbies, meditation and prayer. See where prayer comes in. Exercise performing repetitive tasks, public speaking, playing video games, using digital devices, especially on social media, um, when they're getting it on, say no about that, um, but you probably guess what that is, especially if you've got kids. Um, hypnosis, obviously there, creative activities like writing and drawing, relaxing, using uh, yoga or Tai Chi or anything like that, um, spiritual or mystical experiences, rituals and ceremonies, intense focus of problem solving, or when they're ill, these are times when people change into a trance state. So anybody who's in that kind of state, including you guys listening to me at this moment in time, would be um, in a suggestive position to be able to take in what I'm sharing with you and completely blot out everything else. Now, that's what world leaders need to concentrate on. And most people do it well. That's why they get to that level. But some people, certainly on the way up, do not. Why is that relevant for you guys? Why am I sharing with you? Because you need to have all these skills to be able to position yourself to be more effective in the stuff that you do. So once again, I've been chatting now for about 20 minutes and it does feel a little bit like a Dave Crane monologue. I have no problem doing that, but I would like to know your thoughts and your comments as well. Joanne, fantastic. You've let me suffer long enough and now you come to join me on this stage. Always a pleasure to have you join us. Um, are you in your castle right now or are you somewhere else today? My castle. <laughs> I'm in my house here in Ireland. I'm sacrificing going down to the shops to get me milk from my cup of tea. <laughs> so that's oh. why I'm here talking to you. <laughs> well, just sucking on a raw tea bag. I appreciate the effort to be. Here's the thing I do. I've got two things that I keep. I always keep some coffee, mate, just in case it runs out. The milk runs out. And I also make sure I've got those two in ones or three in ones. You know, when you kind of need to make some coffee and you really have. Mm time i just want to run put some water in it put it in a flask i always keep them yeah. just staying for next time just a little thing okay cool i remember that <laughs> don't say i never help you so here's here's, here's a question then ai tsunami is a thing it's not just a warning it's a thing that's coming do you feel the same thing or are you kind of nah we'll be all right it, no it is a big thing it, like it's a massive change you know and I think I think a lot with this and, and I, I don't like focus on the scary thing, but we do have to be prepared. Right. Um, and I think it's uncertainty. We don't know what this whole AI thing is really capable of. I mean, there's all this talk and we've seen how much it's been advancing and, you know, how much it's been able to match the humanness, you know, when it comes to speech recognition and images and videos and all these kinds of things, you know, and it's just progressing so, so fast. 
And it reminds me of when I was oh, 30 odd years, I'm probably giving my age away now, um, when the internet came around and you know, it was absolutely phenomenal and it was great. It was a novel thing. It was a novel and that's that's what was, you know, hooking people was the novelty and what the internet could do. And it's kind of the same with, with AI, but we're more advanced and it's even more um, powerful than the internet, you know, and it's just, I wonder what can happen. I wonder what, what this is, what can be possible. It's great. And, you know, there's great things it can do, but, you know, what great things also comes, you know, we have to be careful too. <laughs> Big time. I've just been reading this article and it says that the impact of AI should be seen as the equal of electricity and the internet combined on human rights. Mm, because so. it's that effective in the things it's going to change and so on. And we're kind of just pretending we're going to be okay. But remember, this is not going to go away. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to be like somebody could press a button and suddenly there's no more AI. It's here to stay. I was watching a, a movie the other day, which was Jennifer Lopez's latest one called Atlas. The idea is that they have created an artificial intelligence that decided to take over all the robots and kill as many people as possible, then escape uh, to a different planet. So she goes after it using artificial intelligence in this kind of robot suit. Okay, it's a silly little sci-fi thing, but it's not a million miles away from the concept of you thinking, well, what would you do if AI decided it didn't like us anymore? Mm. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to not like us. It just has to decide that it doesn't want us here anymore. We're annoying. Maybe climate change is, is affecting its ability to cool down its systems. So maybe it works out. If they get rid of his people, then the planet goes back to normal. Ozone layer goes back to normal. And it's much easier for my reactors to carry on doing what we're doing. I think what I'm really concerned about is, you know, the, the powers to be and these, you know, intelligent people that are doing all the AI stuff and what have you. And we've been told X, Y and Z, it's great and blah, blah, blah. But I don't trust an awful lot of these powers to be because of what happened in the past. You know, it's like you're in it on your own. It's it's. it's and that's that's what that's what worries me. Like you can't trust these powers to be because we've been told lies all our lives. I know. Without getting political, I agree with you. There's a thing called a social contract that we were given when we went to school, and it's probably existed for hundreds of years. And the idea is that if we vote people into power, those people have our best interests at heart because they want to be able to be successful and survive. So what they will do is they'll open factories or they'll employ people or they'll do stuff that makes money for everybody because they want the social system to be there. And that's certainly what I believed when I went to school, even though I hated school and couldn't wait to leave, or at least that's what I was told we should believe. And it was only later on when you kind of got to school and you thought, well, in my case, I don't like it here. Um, and then when I left, you realize actually you're more successful when you do your own thing. And if I'm waiting for people to look after me, that's not going to happen. That's one of the reasons I left the UK 30 years ago. Because even in the UK or places where they've got a democratic government who gets voted in by the people, it tends to be driven by who's going to make most money out of it. And they tend to lean into that. Now, to go back to what you just said, the bosses who are driving AI are not even the governments in power. They're individuals who are looking to make as much cash out of it as possible in, a, in an effective AI wars. And that has started. Mm. I worry about those people because what you have to do is turn around and say, would they put guardrails on it to make sure we're all safe? Isaac, Isaac Asimov is a famous um, science fiction writer who wrote the, the book... Um, um, I uh, what's it called again? I not I robot. What's the one that Will Smith stood in? Will Smith. I robot. I robot. I robot. There you go. So the original one uh, had three rules for robots, and the first one was not to ever harm a human being. The second mm. one was I think don't argue with a human being, and the third one is fa uh, 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 is. Uh, don't harm yourself unless it has a problem with the first two laws. Something like that. Well, nobody's built those guardrails in. Not one person has said to AI, do not harm human beings. Now, here's where it gets really scary. And it's there's two ways of looking at it. 
There's a scary warfare in the fact that I really believe that right now we're already in, a world, in World War Three. Not that it's going to turn into World War Two with guns and, and countries against each other. I just think that we've got the big powers are playing a game where they get the little countries to fight each other by putting money into them. So it's all going on. We've got, we've got it in Ukraine. We're going to have it soon, maybe in Taiwan and so on. It worries me about the fact that that's continuing. But that's not even the big worry. The big worry is that when it come, when push comes to shove, we don't have any guardrails on looking after making sure that we have jobs and making sure that we can all earn and eat and all the rest of it. Nobody's caring about that. We kind of kind of do it ourselves. And even when it came round to the challenge of how to deal with with the pandemic, as I mentioned. We were anybody in my business was left on their own. Some p countries had a handout from the government, but that did a lot of damage, obviously, to make sure financially that could still work. So, I'm looking for solutions, ideas from the room. Joanne, I appreciate you jumping in, and I've just gone blur quite a lot. What are your thoughts on that? I, you know, I, it's yeah, it's great. I mean, the AI wars thing, and it's always a power and a money thing. Um, when there's no regulations, that's when it gets. I don't like using the word scary, but like it is, you know, when there's no regulations and people are in it for it to have the best and it's a race, you know, I was going to say, mention something else, but I'm not going to because, yeah, about medicine. But um, yeah, it can get, it can, it can, it's all money and power really. And that's what scares the life because the, the little people at the end, you know, are not, they're not considered. To be, and those people rely on, that's why we have governments and what have you, but, you know, we've been lied to and it's very hard to trust. And when it comes down to power and money, like, it's just so sad. I don't think that the people who are in charge of making these decisions are evil people. I think they're just doing their job. And scientists tend not to be evil. They're not cackling and pretending to be Dr. Evil. They just get mm. really excited about how this technology can grow. And they don't look at the, you know, the bad stuff that goes into it. They just look at the stuff. It's like, for instance... And it's something that I can point out. Whenever I, I've got a, a, I've got a, a camera that I use to record my events, a tiny little camera created by the guys that make drones. Now it's a beautiful, incredible piece of technology that does 4K video making, and I can stick it at the back of the room. Great sound, great video. But the one problem I have with it is it follows your face wherever you are to make sure it's always got you in the picture. Not if you've got a brown face. It goes towards the nearest light thing, like a light or a window, so it disappears in the middle of me speaking. Now, why is that a thing? Because the people that made it didn't have brown faces. And so it just didn't come <laughs> conversation. But it's a real conversation for me. And this is where when we talk about AI bias and the challenges that people have, I think this is a real problem for many people to work about because AI doesn't have a space necessarily for women to be equal and it certainly doesn't have it for diversity so i mean looking at a situation where anybody could lose their job in the next two to three years and never have it replaced by something else if they don't step up their game some of us start off with a massive disadvantage because we've only just got those jobs in the first place what are your thoughts on that yeah absolutely i mean i and, and i was talking to my son there yesterday my son's a coder and, and i was asking him this very question you know and i said you know are you using ai and they're tapping into it and what have you but he said we're not allowed to use it in our job because it's very unreliable and it's you know for the amount of time that you spend to get to get the right prompt because you're talking about the prompts you know it's not worth it but in time you know, it, 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 it's only a matter of time, like, you know, before AI learns and what have you. And the thing is, a lot of people are like, ah, there's nothing to be scared about or whatever right now. But it will, I feel it will come very, very fast because everything's getting so, and technology, like, look at the speed of technology, like, in the last 20 years. It's just phenomenal. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I think we do need to be um, on top of it. We do need to uh, keep up with the AI and 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 I don't like using the word pivot, but like reskill ourselves in something else, you know, and just be prepared for the what if, like you know, look look what happened in the pandemic, you know, um, is to have something else, absolutely, whether it's AI or something else, you know, you just don't know. And years ago, like you used to be in your job, on you know, from from day one until you retired, you know, that's the way it was years ago, but it's not like that anymore at all for a long time. I think that I'm going to turn to Zara in a minute, in a minute to catch his thoughts and opinions because I know that he's been studying stuff in AI as well. And I've just I've just literally signed up for a course um, to bring me up to speed with the latest AI stuff. And on this week on my uh, live 
Vodk, um, streaming interview, I talked to a dear friend of mine, Ernesto Verdugo, who has got an AI that he's built from scratch called McKinsey. And McKinsey has created 16 other AIs underneath it that look after running his business effectively. It's quite phenomenal. He talks to it through his phone. He talks to it all the way through the day. And it li literally has become that personal assistant of which, to be honest with you, I've got enough voices in my head and in my house. I don't think I'm ready to add another one at this period in time. But it's fascinating to see that. Zara, what's your thoughts? Please unmute yourself and share yeah. your opinions. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, Dave, as usual, you, you made it. I mean, you always. Uh, you know, like, you remember the early AI were like, we were playing chess. <laughs> yeah. To party. Yeah. yeah. Now, now it's so, uh, so revel it's so advanced and uh, revolutionized that every company now I was, I'm like, I'm working here for a company and they, they, they have that parents cloud computing, cloud computing softwares like Azure and, uh, so they, they and, and and all those advanced AI tools available to hire us to hire some security services um, within UK, and then we assign and deploy guards and check them, check calls and book calls and all with the help of these AI tools, right? Uh, in one way, it's but it's not like that uh, that they're gonna replace me or something because somehow it's me who's giving them all instructions and to you know to to watch everything on the camera. Uh, but but what what uh, I was watching an ad on the Facebook and there was a man he they he, they, they set up your e-commerce business and all and how they are getting sales it's like uh, what they do now they work on the uh, on mid journey so they have like five or six young boys age eighteen or nineteen who just like you know passed their uh, who just completed their college and now they're looking for some part time job and um, people here in Pakistan I'm just telling you a story a little bit story now those part time uh, job seekers they go to these companies who are, who, who are making you uh, some e-commerce websites on Amazon who, uh, uh, blah 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 and uh, they make them learn this midway journey and what they do they do from product hunting to product marketing and advertisement they do everything and how do how do how, how can they take advantage of this AI over here we everybody knows that Pakistan is uh, one of the most uh, largest uh, leather manufacturer in the world, right? Uh, so on the mid journey, they go and they they search something. I mean, for the next leather jacket design, new design, they search on the mid journey. They get new designs, and then they send that to 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 the manufacturer to make a copy of this, and they put it on the Amazon and have more sales. So this way, I mean, even the, the, the children's who the, the young boys who are like getting over with the college and they wanted to learn some new tools, they they join and they, they, they volunteer themselves. They pay them a little money, just a little money, like maybe like 30, 40, 50 dollars per month <laughs> sitting in the office and they're making designs for them and getting sales. So AI is uh, somehow there is a man who there's a there's a boy, there's a man, there's a girl, there's there's, there's a human assistance who is always helping. Um, you know, giving giving instructions to AI. Yeah, you you're right about the rab robotic wars and all, but somehow, uh, being real, I mean, yeah, there will be a war that be like robotics versus robotics or, or controlled by humans, and uh, let's see like who, who who will be the one who who's gonna hack it, <laughs> the systems. <laughs> yeah, here's like. I found it fascinating. I mean, I, every time I know there's a job that's being created, it goes through my head. How long did it take for that job to be automated? And then that person has to now find another job. Searching through a um, through Amazon, looking for things or, or looking for patterns of leather jackets, all the rest of them, uh, involves recognition of ideas. It involves a number of different things that at the moment only humans can do. And it might be with something to do with trends and fashion that only humans can do it because there's a lot of complicated decisions that have to be made uh, based on aesthetics, based on, you know, that looks too much like the 70s. I'd never wear that again. All kinds of things like that and i do believe that a number of the jobs that will be lost will also evolve into something better so for instance when when you talk about you know going to get fast food how much of the stuff in fast food is automated well perhaps when you went to a drive through for say mcdonald's or burger king or whatever then there's a timer that tells the, the person frying the chips how long to leave them in 
leave them in for two minutes and then take them out or whatever it would be, even automating taking them out. Now, does that mean that he doesn't have a job anymore? No, it doesn't. It means his job is to look at the timer and when it goes off, then remove them. So there's lots of things that will become a lot more sophisticated. Plus, as always, there's jobs that didn't exist. Like, for instance, um, social media managers didn't exist. Now they're everywhere. The idea that you t tell somebody how to look at your social media and position your ads and all the rest of it, that's going to evolve into more. So there's lots of really exciting opportunities that don't exist yet. But the challenge is, and this is for everybody in the room, it's for anybody who's approaching 50 or beyond, like in my case, is how flexible are you and how flexible do you want to be about learning new skills? I realize that we're going to have to reinvent and we're going to have to pay attention to what's going on, but it's not always easy. When you're talking about an 18-year-old, their ability and capacity to then take in new stuff as it comes is also based on their knowledge of what it is that they've been accustomed to using. I remember the first time I gave my daughter when she was about two years old, I think it was probably, I gave my, my daughter a magazine to look at, a real magazine. And the first thing she tried to do was to flip the pictures to see what the other pictures are in a magazine. Didn't think about it not being an iPad. Just thought about the fact that it's a picture, so America, I can move it on. So if you're born into that way of thinking, I guess it's going to be relatively easy to adapt to be able to see where that goes next. If you're not from that particular era and you're wondering how to hold on to what you have, you can't. You have to really lean into something that's new, which I find exciting because I'm a, a complete uh, lifelong learner. But if you're looking towards how you retire and you're kind of getting towards there and you're saying, no, I'm almost there, you could have a rug pulled from underneath your feet. And after two years of experiencing very little income for, for, for during a pandemic as an entertainer and speaker, I know how challenging it can be to be able to, at least when it happened, there was a handful of us who were in that position. Not everybody's a professional entertainer or speaker and needs to have an audience in front of you. But what happens when 50% of the workforce is like that? That's what worries me. Zara, what are your thoughts on that? And Joanne, feel free to jump in. And for everybody who joined us, you've got 20 minutes left to, to put your hand up and join us on stage. Otherwise, it's great having you here. Zara, over to you. AI cannot replace Dave Green. AI cannot replace this entertainer. AI cannot replace speaking on stage. AI cannot replace this human-like interaction. Human AI AI cannot AI can be can be some experimental uh, diagram where you can learn or you can tell robots to do this small little operation or something, anything like that. But AI cannot 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 replace this human-like uh, you know love, empathy, kindness, interactions we all have here and we learn here. So uh, I mean uh, we we love you, Dave, and we we know you 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 can. Not be, no matter how much advanced version you can bring of robot here or, or chat GBD anything and you, you you tell him to talk like Dave Crane oh come on we can't we, they can't so keep shining Dave have a great great day and bless y'all that's very kind of you Zara thank you so much for your kindness when you say stuff like that we've got a lot of noise in the background I hope the screaming kids are enjoying themselves and you're not walking about with a baseball that, that'd be terrible um, yeah thank you very much here's the thing um, the reason I bring up this as a real change of mindset is not just because I'm particularly, you know, concerned about my stuff. I do my stuff. I've got a book coming out soon, blah, blah, blah. So I'm quite happy that, that the stuff I've, I've explained to people and the direction you should be taking, which is to create your brand and to speak and so on, is something you need to lean into. But when we talk about the next generation, remember when we were kids, I mean, for me, it was like 8,000 years ago. I was very happy with just having a football. I would go get my football, I'd head up to the park, and I'd see who was around, and we'd play football all day. And we'd get muddy, and we'd hurt ourselves, and we'd go to each other's houses and have something to eat. And I'd come back when it was dark, or come back when I'm really hungry, or when there's nobody else to play with. And then my dad would come back from work, and so on. And that's what I grew up with. Kids nowadays don't leave the house. They generally stay in because of a scaremongering about how dangerous the world is. The truth is the world is no more dangerous than it used to be when I was a kid. It's just better publicized when you do have these creepy people. So everyone becomes a little bit more worried about each other, even though there's no reason to be worried about your kids uh, in the same way as we are right now. But what happens is we kind of adopt these new ways of moving forward. Kids prefer devices to having a ball and a bat to play with. And so when you've got that going on, 
there will be a natural intake of maybe we don't do jobs the way that we used to do them. We do them a different way. And I worry that unless we go back to some kind of um, rigid format of what it really does entail for us to be able to get earned, uh, to get paid and do so on, then it's going to be a challenge. I don't believe that going to school or so, uh, going to school anyway, but going to university is going to guarantee anybody a job in the future. The only way you can guarantee earning is to start learning how to earn. Getting another qualification is going to be a waste of time. I'm sorry if you're working in the academia world, but if you are studying, you know, to be a very good X, Y, Z doctor, lawyer, accountant, any of those jobs, or you can just get the RoboDoc app and just interpret by looking at somebody in front of you, or you've got a sore leg, you've probably got X, Y, and Z. Then there's going to be a ton of people who will cheat. And it's not going to be cheating when everybody else does it. So I wonder where that leads us. So, Ethanil, I hope I've got your name right. Ethanil, uh, Ugo, uh, anyway, over to you. If you put your mic off and uh, you're able to say stuff. I'm sorry for getting your name wrong. It's just that I have to click something. <laughs> all right, all right, Dave. The good morning, Nigeria time. Uh, it's a wonderful being here. Thank you for the awareness so far. I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's great being here. Um, looking at my profile, yeah, you, you try. My name is uh, Ifani Ubomode. Yeah, I'm from in Nigeria. So, looking at my profile, you know, I'm a, uh, a professional accountant, and uh, um, today's topic uh, speaks about AI tsunami. So, I'm looking at um, the cost benefit of uh, adopting AI. Um, over the years, uh, I discovered that uh, companies are still struggling to even uh, uh, adopt a common ERP that is is more affordable than AI. So now, looking at the cost implication, do you think that every business can afford to adopt AI? That's one. And two, you talk about accountants, lawyers, doctors with the charge. Uh, uh, robots whatever um do you think ai can make a strategic uh, decision as against human involvement uh, but i am convinced that it can do in terms of accounting it can be able to do a posting daily transactions and all that but when it comes to strategic decision where an accountant needs to uh give insight on figures and advice management on a strategic direction do you think ai can replace that uh, thank you thank you great points and uh, i apologize for getting your name wrong initially but if i nail if i i've got that bit right i hope here's the thing um do you think ai yeah you got it dude. do you think ai could run traffic lights so it turns it to red and turns it to amber and turns it to green and make sure we don't crash well, yeah, it does. There's nobody there pressing buttons. You think AI can drive trams and trains? Well, in Dubai, we've got automated trams and automated trains in the metro. There's no human beings involved at all. It's all done by AI. And we've been running for about three or four years. So it will be old tech, long before ChatGPT put it out there. Uh, it was there. I think what we're talking about is the ability to make those human decisions based on a number of different factors. But I think it's natural for us to want to lean in to be able to give some of those automation. Now, should that mean complete automation? Well, let's take an example of something that shouldn't be automated. And it's something I was listening to a podcast earlier um, today all about the, the the football, which is the term given to the, the briefcase or the suitcase that follows the president of the United States around, which basically says if a ballistic missile was flying towards the United States, he gets about six minutes to be able to make a decision, 30 minutes before it lands, on whether they're going to retaliate and press buttons back. So it's, in the, it's down to the person that they choose. And most countries have this, by the way, that have uh, nuclear uh, weapons. So it's down to one person as to whether they will say, right, let's press buttons. Now, as soon as they decide that they're going to do something, a menu pops up. And this menu is a bit like going to a restaurant. Which country do we think it is? And which country do we want to retaliate again? Is it those guys or these guys? Or who's it most likely to be? And I won't say um, the, the names that came up because I think it's completely unfair to say so, um, apart from having, no, I can't say. So um, 
that puts everything in the hands of one person. And in the case of America, that's Donald Trump or it's Joe Biden. And for lots of reasons, you'd, you'd think, can we have a third option? Um, but no, you haven't got those two options. So can that be automated? Can that be something that goes to AI instead? I don't want it to be. I want to at least blame a person for making those decisions on what happens, not just get an AI to say, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do that. But then it comes down to our decisions about the leaders. Now, we talked about the leaders before earlier, saying that AI is being developed by people who are not elected leaders. And we've had this since Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and, and uh, Steve Jobs and, and, and Bill Gates created these incredible companies that meant that they were dealing with countries around the world and they lean into many different countries or at least have a, have a, have a say in what goes on around the world. Google is exactly the same. They're not elected. They're private citizens. So the accountability becomes really, really difficult to hold them to it. And they won't do it when governments have said, right, we're not going to, we, we don't want you to do this. We want social media to be responsible. They go, yeah, fine, whatever. You also find a situation where um, Mark Zuckerberg was brought into Congress in America and asked to explain what is this TikTok by some old fella who had never heard of it before to have to justify why it exists. So there's a massive discrepancy at the highest level between what should be there and what shouldn't be there. I think we're going to see a lot of advantages. So first of all, when we talk about medicine, I think the idea of having an app that could diagnose what's wrong with somebody by scanning them, by looking at the problems and telling somebody who's a nurse what the suggestions should be will be fantastic for somebody who's stuck up in the mountains and they've got somebody who's injured or somebody who's ill or in a remote village in some country where um, they, they need to get access to medical supplies or at least medical knowledge uh, and they can very simply just go onto a phone AI will facilitate a large amount of it, and they can maybe have a 3D printer that can pr produce medicine or produce a cast or produce some, something that's going to help people. I see massive advantages in that. Just a quick one. If you love what I do and want to work with me, go to the VIP mentoring site and get yourself registered. Whatever it is you want to do, this is a QR code. I'll go to www.speakonstage.com backslash summer VIP backslash. All the details are there. I'm waiting for you. One to one exclusive sessions to build your signature product. What is it? Find out. Take a look. Work with you soon. That's it. Back to the podcast. It's the decision-making process that leads to that, that worries me that everyone has the best interests at heart. Should we be looking at it from a purely commercial point of view, that it's worth money to everybody if we have these robo-doctors and robo-printers and all the rest of it? Or should we just put our hand down and say, no, we can't have it? Now, nobody's looking for my hand. Nobody's interested. But there was a case, let me add it before I open it up to discussion. I'd love to get your, your opinion back on this, Afania, as well. Um, years ago, when Re Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev were having this arms race between the, were the back end of a Cold War between America and Russia, they were fighting to get as many different bombs in place as possible. Nuclear warheads, all the rest of it. And Ronald Reagan at the time was going, we've got our Star Wars program as well. Let's get some of that. Let's get nuclear um, warheads in space. And then a documentary came out. It was kind of like a documentary, but a movie as well. It was called The Day After. I think it was called The Day After or something like that. Anyway, this documentary was shown in the days before we had satellite TV. So it would have been shown on American TV and 100 million people watched it. Now, America's got about 300 million now, but in those days, that was about half the population. And even though people said to, to Ronald Reagan, don't watch it, it's got nothing to do with us, he watched it anyway. And he went into a massive depression. Then he made a phone call to his Russian rival, which I, I don't know if it's Khrushchev or it was Gorbachev, but anyway, whoever his Russian rival was, and he said, we need to talk. They met. They made peace accords. 
and they brought the amount of warheads in the world right down from 70,000 to 12,000 on the back of that. Why would that happen? Because people talked about it and they said, we cannot have it. So as we're having this discussion in this room at the moment, and there's people who are in here and I value and I'm so grateful for everybody to be here. Do not think for a second that your opinion and your voice is invalid. Every single person here, if you make enough noise or you move in a certain direction, will get their opinion. It will go into somebody somewhere who says something to someone and maybe we do end up in a situation, as uh, Ifani has mentioned, where people do pay attention and they do make the world a better place, rather than this AI tsunami that's going to wipe everybody out. Thoughts on that? Again, my monologue's gone far too long, but I'd love to have your opinion from everybody who's on stage right now. Unless everyone's gone into a massive depression. Dave's really worried. You know what, you know what Dave? It's from... Uh, like how we uh, see fintech, biotech, nanotech, smart tech, these, these all words ending with tech, tech, tech nowadays. Uh, that, that, that is like something we, we, we are learning some new tools, right? Every day, every day, a new a nothing, something like coming out for the AI thing. And, uh, and, and, and some people, some people who, who were employees, for example, employees of the companies, and the leaders, they, they are now, they're now trying to introduce those new tools to them so that they can get familiar and to, to, so that they should not be, you know, that fear of having, losing their jobs for the managers because managers are now, uh, now like 50 plus, 55 plus, and, and, and that's, that's, that's their time to get retired and, you know, everything like that because they have been working for 15, 20 years without AI and now something like AI has introduced to them and now they have to learn chat, chat GPT 4.0 or something like that to, to, to get their skills in the game because now the companies and organizations around the world have made a check. So uh, you, we have to learn these tools uh, as far as uh, we have to stay in the industry. Yeah, so that's me. Uh, Thank you, Dave. You uh, hope I accidentally move, uh, moved you back to listening. It's only because I wanted to make sure that your your mic wasn't on, and so we've checked that it works properly. Because sometimes there's a lot of the uh, noise and feedback and so on. If you like to bring yourself back on stage again, I'll let you back up. Um, so I apologise for pressing the wrong button there. If Anya, do you, you want to add to that? Because I did monologue quite a lot about the the decisions that are tempered by conversations like this in front of people who otherwise get really excited about technology and about domination and about positioning themselves to be really doing well around the world. Sometimes it needs to be that we, we share these conversations with them um, so they can pay more attention and do stuff for us. Uh, Mas has just joined us as always, right at the end of when we've finished speaking. Um, but uh, it's great to have you here. Mas, what are your thoughts on this? Hi, Dave. Um, always happy to be part of uh, this insightful uh, exchange conversation. Um, so regarding uh, what you mentioned, regarding the last uh, comment, this is so revealing because, you know, most of the time the um, top leaders are kept in uh, a total blur of what's going on around them. And uh, whenever they are aware, they would react in a different way because most of the decisions are taken by the entourage, which varies based on the type of entourage they have. Uh, that relate actually to the AI conversation you had before also. The main and uh, most factor that AI will never take uh, above is emotion. And it applies also for what you said regarding the common sense and the emotion of reducing the, the world towards peace, you know? So this is something that uh, more and more people should consider. And uh, emotion is, the, is uh, what makes the difference between a machine and a human being. And there is more and more uh, place given to also the, uh, the emotional intelligence these days that will totally take over. I mean, it will be a big, uh, I wouldn't say fight but uh, or conflict, but there is definitely some interaction to be made between the emotion and the AI. Uh, I want your uh, opinion on that. What do you think? Well, I think that we'll be very surprised how long it's going to take for 
AI to simulate emotions. I mean, exactly. Can, mm -hmm. uh, what is a funny joke um, from seeing what, Elva, what other funny jokes are out there and it can reproduce them. And here's the thing that I find that right now, most people on the planet are on, are on the spectrum of um, emotional intelligence, going from very little to huge amounts to overbearing emotional intelligence. Everyone's got different levels of what they are. Um, those people who have very little emotional intelligence are almost like they're automated. They just don't the, the challenges that people are going through or they don't care about it. And so I think at the very least, AI can reproduce, reproduce them. But to get real empathy, I don't think you need to have massive emo uh, uh, emotional intelligence. It's great if you do, because the next stages are driven by that. You just need to ask the right kind of questions. So, for instance, if a doctor says to you, how are you feeling? You say, not very well. You go, OK, what's the problem? Well, I mean, you tell people what, what's been going on. Does a doctor have to be a doctor to work out what's going wrong? No, it could be AI with a checklist. So a number of the things that we deal with through AI um, sorry, deal with for emotional intelligence um, and knowledge of people can be reproduced. And I don't think that's a terrible thing. I think the world's full of very lonely people. I think there's something I predicted about, I don't know, about four weeks ago or maybe even further. I said there's going to be a massive adoption of AI girlfriends and boyfriends where you pay a subscription to, to fall in love with your AI, which is your assistant, but it also becomes your partner. And there'll be marriages done like that. And I still believe that's going to be a massive And I think it's a real problem, not because it doesn't deal with the, sh the challenges of being lonely, but because it drives us further into not interacting as human beings. And I think that that is a real issue, if that explains it. Mm -hmm. So, and there, there, regarding the... Re Hello? Yeah, regarding the interaction for, uh, you know, like the the couple relation, uh, that's another discussion we can have regarding all these dating apps and so on, because they are lead by algorithm that uh, also can be completely wrong. But that that's a total uh, side discussion, and uh, it might be actually a good uh, topic to tap into. It, it's a fascinating topic that we may bring up in a certain future episode, but I want to make sure that my wife is completely on <laughs> rather than me going in the direction. <laughs> now, there's, here's one of the things, I mean, it's without going near the, the, the apps problem, when we meet somebody that we find attractive, most of the time it's got nothing to do with their qualifications or their their or, or what you'd read on paper. It could be somebody that has a smile or they're really funny or you, that makes you warm to them and want to hang out more with them. You can't do that when you're swiping left or right on somebody. And so there's a lot of human interaction that disappears um, from apps anyway. And that's leading to a massive problem that people aren't having babies and they aren't meeting others. They're just starting to do their own thing. But you see, now you've started this, Almasa, there's a whole conversation <laughs> an hour long, which <laughs> to get into on this one hope we're going to give you a chance to be able to speak it's not because we don't love you it's because sometimes it's a challenge with your internet do you want to unmute and then share what you can and if it is a problem i'll mute you again but it's not not no offense intended so it's a hope no no mm -hmm. no I, I hear you very clearly but i have some background sounds like somebody speaking in the back no it's mm -hmm. trying to speak but uh, okay okay but don't, okay. don't say anything. Give them five seconds or so to be able to speak. No problem. Over to you. No problem. All right. It is it, actually to, to uh, thank you very much, everyone. Hello, everyone. So it's actually tailored to what our master was trying to say, which is the data and the algorithms and all that. What I believe where um, AI comes in, uh, if you ignore that, is because uh, tokenization and data encryption is already creating a space where AI can play a role and once they can do that people become safe to keep their money with this cryptocurrency with this AI are facilitated or mechanized ways of banking so it's becoming a threat that is why I support Dave hundred percent with what happens to those who ignore AI so that I mean uh, that's all just thank you very much 
I appreciate that hope and you're spot on. Um, there are going to be spaces, there are going to be challenges, and I want everyone to consider as we're kind of putting this room to bed. Now, I don't have to stop it immediately, but I can keep it going for a little bit longer. Can you imagine what it was like when everybody was working as farmers in the fields and we're going through the agricultural revolution? So everybody was 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 creating what the, the wheat and and, and the, the, the cows or whatever animals they were, were, were looking after, the chickens. And now, and they, they now it's like, now it's like agri-tech. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. Please keep on. Well, keep going. Exactly. But what I was going to say was as soon as the factories were opened and they started creating machines that could do what farmers were doing, if you were a farmer, you had no choice but to then reskill or get a job in the factories or whatever you could do because your job was obsolete. Now, we don't worry about that because that was hundreds of years ago and that process created education where they created schools to be able to get the kids out of the fields into the factories by giving them certain tests. Now, the, the education system hasn't been updated since then. It's done for getting people out of the fields into the factories and nobody's changed it because there's so much money involved in it and you've got to have really smart people to come up with something different like teach everyone to be a freelancer and I can't see that catching on yet but maybe it will. So, I wanted to mention that because if you were a farmer and you had to re-skill yourself, how would you feel? I think that's what people are going to feel like in the next two years. Thoughts to the room. Amazing. Dave, you're absolutely right. It's like, uh, um, first it was like we, we used to go to the... I, I, am I audible? Yeah, I can yeah? definitely go on. I mean, we uh, first it was like we the, the old practices, and now it's like the advanced practices that are like being introduced. So the more quickly we learn about these all new practices, the more we grow faster. So uh, I hope I make sense, yeah. You do make perfect sense, and I think that for anybody who's been in today's group, there's a couple of things I'd like to share. First of all, your comments and thoughts are really, really appreciated. If you'd like to leave a comment about what you enjoyed about the group or or, or, or just what you got out of it, um, that would be really useful because it helps us to market it, to get more people to come and join us in future episodes. Um, just leaving a simple comment or sharing it, I enjoyed being on this call, uh, really helps. The other thing I was going to say is... This is just dipping our toes in the water. This is nothing in comparison to what it's going to be. We're going to find that AI is going to add so many different levels. I don't think we're going to be anywhere near catching up. I mentioned before that ChatGPT4, the previous one before the one that's just come out, had an intellect of about 150 IQ when Einstein had 160 IQ, which meant that the smartest person on the planet was still smarter than AI, even though he's been dead for the best part of 50, 60 years. New one, ChatGPT 4.0, is twice as smart as the previous one. Now, AI and OpenAI already have ChatGPT 7 waiting to be released, and they're not going to do it yet. Think about if you've been to have a look at what they were doing with animating um, words. Well, I can't remember the name of the site, the site where they could make videos just from descriptions and the impact that's going to have already on anybody working in movies. But... That's just looking at the basics. In a couple of years' time, we're going to end up with AI being about a billion times smarter than we are. Now, the hope is that we've got a sweet space that's going to allow us to still continue what we're doing because nothing can reproduce that. And it may well be that when we pivot a little bit, we can find something. At the end of the day, getting the stuff from the fields out of the factories um, and into horse-drawn carriages had to be done by humans. And as there was more efficiency for creating more food, then the population could grow and more people would be employed. Does that mean they got paid more money? I don't think so. It doesn't tend to happen like that. Those guys who own everything tend to own the decision-making and who gets paid more anyway. But that's aside from it. But what we do need to know is that when we studied all the skills and the degrees and the, the school stuff that we had, how many of those things you studied have turned into a job for you that actually earned some money? Some of it might turn into happiness that you exploit and use and, and enjoy on a regular basis. But how much of it actually turned into something? That's kind of what you need to think about now. You need to look back at your, your transferable skills, add a little bit of pixie dusk, 
dust uh, of what AI could do to take that to a new level and start brainstorming what that would mean in the future. And I think the smartest way to start making that happen is to throw it into chat GPT or your preferred sort of AI. Say, I do this for a living. What do you think will happen when um, AI starts automating this? Where could I go? What are the options and what route should I take to raise my game to be there? I guarantee it's going to blow your mind, but it can give you a six month route, a two year route. Remember in 2027, it's been predicted that 50% of the world's jobs will not exist anymore. So I would learn as fast as possible how to head off on that journey. Now, here's the thing. When you start doing this, things should go wrong. You'll end up going down the wrong path. You'll end up wasting money. You'll end up spending a lot of time on stuff and you go, oh, somebody else has done that. But here's the thing about being entrepreneur that I will just advise everybody to do. When you are a successful entrepreneur, you end up failing more times than everybody else until you get the right way forward. Each time you fail, each time you get it wrong, you're still miles ahead of a competition who haven't even started out yet. So use your opportunity to get things wrong because at some point you'll get a sweet spot and you go, actually, that'd be a really good side hustle. Maybe I'm not earning from it right now, but I can make some collaborations with some people who do this for a living or they're looking for something to fill that gap. Maybe even do it for free just to make sure that my skills are up to speed so I can sell them commercially later. I would suggest for everybody start thinking about doing that because as you start doing it, you know that you're creating something that one day you might have to lean into. The reason that I started running this group and I started doing my industry icon training is purely because when you can't speak, because there's no speaking gigs, what else can you fall back on? I used to be a minor celebrity in Dubai, so I knew how to be a sort of tiny fraction of a Kardashian. I realized that teaching people how to be minor celebrities would really work well for them in the business world, where you're not looking to be a household name, but you are looking to be more prominent. Now that took a number of different stages and a number of different ways to get to that path. But now I'm gonna be talking about that in the Vatican to members of, of heads of state and to Nobel Prize winners and some very smart people. Now I'm not saying that to say Dave's great. I promise you that's not the point. What I'm saying is when I first started doing it, I didn't know where it was gonna go but it's very exciting. I actually have some big names turning around saying, Dave, we'd like to partner. What have you got that we'd be interested in? So when you're coming up with stuff and you think, well, maybe the people I know can't help me or they're not interested, the people you know are not the ones that you're looking for. The ones that you're looking for will find you or you will find them and they'll be interested if you've got something that they want. The world is going to reinvent itself. So you might as well go out there and start getting your fingers and your toes dirty and wet because it's a really good opportunity facing everybody. And sometimes just knowing more might be the survival tip that you need to be able to do well. I hope that's okay for a bit of a soapbox monologue. I tend to talk a lot. That was amazing. That was amazing, Dave. Thank you so much, Zara. I really appreciate that. What I'm going to do now, out of respect for everybody, because I could hog the mic and keep talking for hours, uh, and I often do, but on a Sunday, I don't do that because everyone's got better things to do. I'm going to just move through and invite everybody on the stage just to have the final, uh, uh, final mention of what they thought was useful today, or a final tip, or anything you'd like to have as a leaving thought for today's session before we close the group. So I'm going to go to our friend in the wonderful blue suit, who I get his name wrong, but I'll try my best not to get it today. So, Afanyi, what's your thoughts? Anything you'd like to share with the group? Just have to unmute. As we're waiting for him to do that, um, Almasa, would you like to share your thoughts on today's session? What you call? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll come back to the emotion part, uh, and uh, I really appreciate. Uh, um, I, I mean, to learn about the um, the president episode, uh, which I was not aware of. So this is my main takeaway for today. And thank you for uh, always, you know, bringing some new, insightful uh, reflections and uh, uh, topics and. Uh, it's, it's great to be part of that community. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Pleasure, thank you so much. I'll drop it into the comments section. It was a diary with uh, a diary of a CEO, Stephen Bartlett, and the episode was basically that fifty percent of uh, over fifty percent of the world would be destroyed in seventy two minutes if somebody pressed a button. That's how scary it was. Seventy two minutes it would take for fifty percent of the world to disappear. And uh, what was said, I can't remember who, who mentioned it, but somebody really smart said, if you did survive it, you'd probably wish you were one of the lucky ones who didn't. So that's kind of like a scary, but uh, an incredible episode in Bartlett. I'll drop the links in so you can listen to it properly um, for you, Almasa. Okay. This is really optimistic. <laughs> well, optimistic, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course, but yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. For other people, that's my point. Um, Hope, do you want to say a, a final goodbye comment if your, your internet's working well? Well, uh, this is, is a beat. I'm from time to time I'm out my best and I will make videos. All right, so you can see how Lagos is nice. So the point of what I'm saying is I really enjoy, uh, you know, the whole topic. And I really, really hope, I really, really hope that time we begin to trust the fact that this uh, is not to, like you know, take from us to add to what we are going to do. Uh, you know, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that, Hope. As you're saying, um, it starts conversations and it doesn't matter where you are in the world um, right now. I think it's part of our duty to turn to the people that we love or the people that we interact with or people that we just do business with and just share with them, like, what are you doing about AI? Are you interested in it? Are you paying attention? Well, maybe here's a few th ideas or thoughts because you never know that might well save their life and their business career. So Zara, you've been very vocal today. It's been great to have you with your insights as well. I know that you're studying all things AI, so you're the expert in the room. Uh, your thoughts on today's session? Dave, it's like uh, first we have to ask ourselves whether when we created AI, for example, uh, why did we create AI? Uh, is it for to help humans or is it to replace humans? Uh, there are many things. I mean, we have to ask ourselves about, uh, because now it's been created and it's been like two, three years, four years. I mean, uh, now it's more in the advancement stages. So we have to, we have to, I mean, uh, there are many questions, like you said, click the button and boom. It's gone. So uh, are we going to uh, monitor that in the future? Or how, how do we have to monitor, mo monitor it? Some regulatory checks or something, which, which are being in discussion now. I was watching the other day some videos. So yeah, hopefully, uh, in, in, let's see in coming few months, because every day is a new, new, new thing in the AI. So. Right. Well, yeah, it's, thank you very much for that. And I appreciate you being here to share those thoughts with us. Uh, AI has been around for, hundred, for hundreds of years, actually, not in the form that we've had it, but printing press was actually in some degree, it was AI and it's been used in many different formats. The one that we use right now is probably closer to about 30 or so years. It's been, it's only commercially been available the way it has been for the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things is, I'll just show this uh, before we go to Fanny for his thoughts on it. Um, if you do listen to that podcast uh, that I mentioned, uh, we all talk about computers, but computers never used to be robots. Computer was a title given to a person who worked things out. You got a job as a computer or an accountant or a reader, or a chef. A computer was somebody who worked things out. And it was a gentleman, I can't remember his name, uh, not Robert Vaughan, but something like that, Ian John Vaughan. So anyway, this guy um, was very smart, worked for NASA, and created about the same size as a house, a machine that could do all the computing. And what happened was, and it's not Babbitt, it's somebody else. Uh, what happened was he could still outthink the computer and he could work calculations out faster than it could until it got to a point where it was faster than him. And then he said, right, we've got it now, build more. So AI is not a new thing. It's been around for a long time. And if we trace the history, I'm sure it will make more sense. So, if Anya, you've just got. You do make sense because uh, now they are like a car systems that you get the load shield directly into the into the into the space shift or or in the in the in the aircrafts and the in the fighter jets and everything. You get the load sheets in the car systems. You just have to put the weights inside and boom, the the zero fuel weight is there, the Mac is there, the, the aircraft is balanced, and now you're ready to take off. So you're right. It's been there in the industry for like more than ten years now. You're right. 
Absolutely. But we're, we're, we're paying attention to it now because it's coming after us more than before. Athani, you, you, we tried to get you on stage earlier just to say your last few Okay. Uh, my, thank you, Dave and uh, Zara. And uh, I, I want to, in addendum to what Zara said, I want to also add, um, looking at AI, I, I'm saying, I want to know, um, the, the, the introduction of AI, is it to help women's work? Or to replace women, just like uh, uh, Zara have said. If that is the case, oh, oh, what impact will a man benefit by uh, adopting uh, um, a, 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 like a software that will replace uh, 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 is a means of likelihood? Do you think such person will uh, support the adoption of AI? So uh, I, I want to get the overall objective of AI. Is it to replace human being? or just to help to facilitate the work of human beings so that uh, hours work can be reduced while the job still remains so uh, i think we should look at it that way so that uh, the adoption can be generally acceptable by all works of life uh, i think uh, that's another way i'm looking at it why um people um um i resisting uh, the adoption of ai in terms of uh, um making it a, a common uh, tool to to use in the process of executing the attacks yeah i agree with you completely by the way it's a great thought and great way of looking at it. what i would say is cars were created to be able to get from a to b faster automated without having streets that are full of horse poo and they're much more efficient doing it and so on but it doesn't mean that the creation of a car and automated vehicles hasn't led to the ozone layer problem that we have now with climate change directly because of all the exhaust fumes and and the, the dangers that go into creating that automation so ai i don't believe was done to make us have a better life but it's how we use it is going to make the biggest impact Okay, okay, okay. In, in that case, oh, 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 what's your advice? Is it that every every person should uh, know about AI and uh, know how it operates and take advantage of it, have you acquiring the skill to be um, AI uh, genius or what? So what impact will uh, man play uh, in AI? Um, great question, but we're not going to have an answer to it today. We're not going to have an answer to it in, in less than two years. But it's a fascinating thing. And that, but as always, I say, just keep your ears peeled, uh, get your ears and your eyes open. Start learning as much as you possibly can. And uh, this conversation is something that we have on a more regular basis every Sunday in this group. But we're going to be bringing everybody back again uh, next Sunday to see what's happened in AI. You never know. We might end up bringing a at some point in this room we will have an ai voice joining us it might even be next week if i can get access to that scarlett johansson um voice uh, thing i'll maybe add it to the conversation uh, and see what that brings to it to what we're doing right now but for now anyway if i need, i really appreciate you being part of our group and part of this conversation i'd love to have your comments uh, in the comment section i look forward to seeing you same time next week Thank you very much, Dave. So uh, I also one last thing, uh, not uh, how do I become part of your mentee? Well, I know that you mentor people, so how do I become part of your mentee? Okay, fantastic. If you look at the comments section, um, and if you look at the details section, I've got a number of links there to be able to get a chance to work with me, or message me directly in um, in LinkedIn, and I'll share some details with you. I need to know who you are, what you do, and what the most uh, most best solution for you would be. But I do have a number of different programs available you can see inside the details section uh, on this particular post. But thank you for asking, and I look forward to the conversation. Okay, thanks so much. I'm going to I'm going to send you. Uh, if, um, I'm going to add you to my connects uh, so that you accept me. Um, we'll start. We'll take it from there. Is that fine? Wonderful. Look forward to talking to you. Cheers, my friend. All right. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye. And Joanne, you were first to pop up and last to leave. 
So ah. your thoughts on the group? Because we we started off just trying to save the world as we always do, and then we just <laughs> let's just go back to sleep. It's easier. Uh, it, it got quite interesting, not heated, but really interesting, didn't it? What's your thoughts on today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, things to explore, you know, and all we know is what we know that's going on at the moment, and we can. Yeah, look, there's, there's a lot. And I think this conversation will be ongoing for a long time. But look, here's something that I was just thinking of. And by the way, actually, Annie, Annie Jacobson is the nuclear war expert that you were thinking of with the diary CEO. I ah, think. there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I was thinking was I, I jotted down about our teenagers, right, our teenagers of the world today, that we really need to look after our teenagers. And here's why. I, I think teenagers don't do authority like we did when we were growing up, right? And that's a good thing. Um, but we need to nurture and remind our, our teenagers there's a lot, there are a lot of challenges in the world at the moment, you know, with phones and going to bed with the phones and sleep and all that sort of stuff, right? But they're not as easily controlled as we were when we were growing up as adults, right? So they're emerging, they're our next leaders in the world, they're very curious. And something that you were saying about the learning. Um, you know, down in school, we're very dumbed down and all the rest. Teenagers are very different. Their, their minds are very different. Uh, and you were talking about learning how to learn and um, and reskill now that that's really super important, obviously, because there's a lot evolving and we were adapted to, for evolving and what have you. And with our teenagers, um, uh, the creativity is very important because it's all about future thinking and future solving and, all, and not, not living in the past all the time. Jim, Jim Quick is a very good guy to follow in terms of learning how to learn. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot in there. It might be another another thing to talk about, but I think we need to mind our teenagers. That's that's my my bottom message. I do think you're absolutely right, and that sounds like a subject for a future session. But on today's session, uh, having got an extra twenty minutes over what I advertised I was going to do, I'm going to put the whole thing to bed there. But thank you, Joanne, for joining us, and thank you for jumping on stage first because that's always appreciated. It makes my job a lot easier after giving twenty minutes of monologue to have a friendly face and a friendly voice to come up and join me. So with that being said, if I need, uh, we'll have a chat directly. I'm not going to bring you on stage at the moment because I want to make sure that everybody here gets a chance to go off and do bigger and better things for the remainder of their weekend. I hope you got something from today's session. It's always a pleasure to be able to hear what's going on out there because one of the challenges, I think, with AI is it drives you into a space where you think far too much on your own. I think we need to be talking collaboratively we need to share ideas because having that and having different opinions, especially ones that you disagree with, put you in a position where you can be better armed to be able to deal with what's coming forward. What's going to happen in the future is always challenging, but I also believe it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody to grow and maybe create that world that we've always wanted to have where our younger people who will be inheriting it from us have actually got the opportunities that maybe we didn't have. But it all starts with a conversation. And those conversations grow into something special. And those things that grow into something special is what we're starting today. So as always, it's a pleasure having you here. And I urge you to join our WhatsApp group. The details are there. When I come back from the Vatican, if they let me leave, I will share with you a couple of ideas and a couple of insights and maybe put together a little documentary that I'll broadcast for you. But meanwhile, have an amazing weekend. It's an honor to have you here joining us. It's a real pleasure to find out your thoughts and to be able to share that with many other like-minded people. We are growing a community here, but it all starts with a conversation. And I wouldn't like to spend that conversation with anybody else but the people that we've had here today. So look after yourself. Remember to jump and grow wings on the way down. I look forward to catching you soon on Speak on Stage. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.